I have a question uh, for Ben. This is about the millionaires versus everybody else. The, uh, the results the results you presented were about policies that are in the social welfare domain exclusively, I think. Yes, and I understand where you might want to start there, but I was curious about differences between millionaires and the rest of us on other matters, on matters of race and immigration and foreign policy and so on. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? That's a good question. The CSIS study was limited in, in size, and we focused on those social welfare kinds of policies. We know a little bit about other policies, particularly we know from the billionaire study that I'm involved in, uh, different methodology and so forth, that a lot of very wealthy Americans are libertarian and rather liberal on a lot of social issues, um, civil rights, civil liberties, uh, women's issues, gays, and so forth. Um, and I can't really say more than that. I mean, if, if you can find somebody who will come up with five or six million dollars, we will be able to answer that question with a national survey. But so far, we haven't gotten it. Ted's got Can I sell Rob Makers instead? Well, it seems to me it's an important part of the story because the, the crux of the disagreement appears to be, at least in part, how different people who have man, massive resources, how different they are from the rest of us. And difference doesn't apply merely to social welfare questions. Right? Yes. The, the question of influence of the very rich goes well beyond what they do to protect their bankroll. You know, if, if what you're saying is that it's the people who are very rich who are running things, then they're running all kinds of things, including social welfare policy. That's um, right. And if I could just comment a little more on that, I think it's a problem of the Democratic Party in particular that its wealthy base tends to be very liberal on social issues, somewhat more so in, in many cases than the average person. So as Larry Bartels has pointed out, I think he's absolutely right. If you had better representation of the average citizen, uh, two groups that would be unhappy with some of the results would be wealthy people and college professors. Um, so it's not, it, you're quite right, by the, the implication you're making is quite right that it's not all about wealthy people protecting themselves. They have a number of different effects on politics. Okay, Mark? Yeah. This actually follows Don's question a little bit, so maybe you've already said what there is to say about it. But I was wondering about the limitations of uh, having all these policies uh, taken together, really pooling the policies, and whether or not there are important sub-dimensions, even in the social welfare area, uh, yeah. and certain kinds of policies might be outliers, and other kinds might be driving the result of working to others. Uh, so have you done, or could you get some leverage out of uh, seeing whether your, your, your findings and your models apply equally well to some areas of policy. Uh, of Definitely a good idea to do. <coughs> Marty did some of that in one of the chapters of his Affluence and Influence book. And I would say my summary would be not very big differences by issue areas. We found the same thing. What I presented you in terms of results holds on economic and non economic. So I guess I want to ask the same question, but slightly different in terms of, so you've compared different issue domains. Is there a way to look at how consequential these bills are? So is it that some groups win on bills that are really consequential, where we talk about big shifts in policy versus like small shifts in policy? Is there any way to disentangle that with this data? Who are you asking? <laughs> Hopefully. I'll, I'll give a shot at that. I think it's very difficult because nobody has a good way to decide which, which policies are most important. You could, on spending questions, you could look at how much of the budget's involved and so forth. But often it's very subjective. You know, is abortion more or less important than uh, women's, than uh, other aspects of women's rights or than gay rights or who knows? Uh, 
Well, a lot of people, have, it's a good question. We've talked about this. I mean, there are people who tried to do this, right, legislation that is considered important. Lipinski, other people, Mayhew does this, right, important legislation. We, we, we have talked about this, and I don't believe, although I forget, let me know, please correct me if I, I'm forgetting, but I don't think we were able to, we pursued it very uh, seriously because of the ends issue, right? We were, we were able to find not many cases where we have public opinion where we could do a reasonable amount of analysis, have any kind of statistical power, right? Um, but if you have any ideas, I, I, we welcome them. We don't have any horses in this race. We're just trying to figure out how the world works. Okay, go ahead. Um, I have a question for both presentations, and I guess it's to, to look into the data you don't have on the very, very top income bracket. So let's say that instead of top 10%, you're looking at top 0.1%. Because I think in the income to debate, that's where the debate is on influence of those individuals. I know you don't have that, but if you did, do you have any guesses or thoughts about what that would tell you? Well, I think we have, we have his guess, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a little more than a guess. We do, um, I'm, I'm working with J.C. Wright and Matt Lacombe on billionaires. Uh, and in fact, the 100 wealthiest billionaires were a lot more wealthy than 0.01%. Um, and of course, all we can get at is publicly available actions and talk by these people. You can't do surveys. Even the Survey of Consumer Finances doesn't try, basically. Um, these people are very private. They won't do surveys and so forth. Maybe but <laughs> Just pay them something, yes. It would have to be quite a <laughs> So, without going into detail, um, Jay invented a really smart way to search the web for everything they say and do about particular political issues. And to compress things a lot, our first major finding looking at tax policy and social security policy was that the 100 wealthiest billionaires are extremely active politically. Everybody knows this. FEC will <coughs> tell you that. But they say almost nothing about specific policies. We call it stealth politics. Maybe that's a little tendentious. But I think it's, there's some, some point to it that a number of these people probably prefer not to take a public position because they would offend stockholders, customers, and so forth. And in fact, um, billionaires who have customer, um, consumer facing enterprises tend to be even quieter than the others. Um, they mostly contribute to Republicans, as everybody knows, but that's only by about two to one. And I think a crucial thing about wealthy people's political influence is that it works through both parties. Um, in other words, some people will say, well, the Democrats have their billionaires too, so it all kind of washes out. First of all, it doesn't wash out, it's two to one Republican. But secondly, uh, the, the Democrats' wealthy people almost certainly influence the party in ways Don alluded to, one kind of way in which uh, they probably do, but there are others as well, including Goldman Sachs type secretaries of treasury. Oh, do you want to say? Hey, do you mind if I get it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't disagree on the different side. The, the only thing is, and I, I'm not. I don't know if I disagree or agree on the on the the, the effect side, the representation, the congruence side. But we don't know. I mean, whether or not the results would differ would depend on the true model, right? So if the true model is the 75th percentiles being, you know, that's the, well, then you're not going to be better off, including the, the, the top one percent, right? You'll be worse off, right? And so, uh, but I don't know what that true model is. Hakeem, thanks for. Yeah, I was just wondering, and I don't know how it's interesting in the conversation, but uh, so we have here what you all presented was one dimension of public opinion, so the direction of preferences. But we uh, didn't have much discussion about the level of importance that these different groups might place on different issues. So that's the, that's the starting question. And then maybe secondarily, uh, maybe as a, as a politician, as a member of Congress, I attend to one group and and one domain of policy, and you all hinted at this, and I'm more, so in campaign finance, perhaps I'm more worried about uh, elite opinion among these uh, the one percenters or whomever, uh, and maybe in another domain of public policy, I'm more concerned with what, what these uh, middle income or poor folks care about. So those are 
those are my uh, my two sort of top of mind questions. Yeah, well, there is. Yeah, we 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 tend to the show the importance of salience. Um, Marty has also demonstrated that in some of his work, um, but I'm not. I, I, I can't speak authoritatively to that. Uh, but yeah, so the importance of issues to the general public matter. There's less work been done on, um, uh, well, it, it, on, on uh, cross-group salience, although, I mean, we're big fans of that work, right? Um, we haven't done, we, I don't think we've directly tested anything relating to that in the context of this particular project. I mean, it is kind of, it does kind of fall, fall out a little bit like that, right? I mean, um, one could argue that welfare and health, you should expect some groups maybe to be a little bit more uh, respected politically than others. But it, uh, at least based on the analysis we've done, it's not an obvious pattern. If the questions have quieted for the moment, I wanted to, to just make a comment about who's the rich. I mean, Chris used the word rich a lot <laughs> in his presentation including when he was uh, referring to Marty's data, Marty does not call these people rich. He calls them affluent, and there's a very good reason. They are nowhere near rich. Top 20% of income, and terciles are even much looser. I mean, a third of Americans are rich? No. Uh, it's not a very reasonable use of the, of the word rich. And I think one of the things that you learn in listening to the two of us is that a whole lot depends on available data. Most of the, the work on influence necessarily has to rely on, on um, general population surveys, essentially, and sort of gathering as many fairly high income people as you can get. And that's why Larry Bartels uses the top third in his Senate representation study. That's why Marty uses the top 20%. I want to make a pitch for studying actually rich people. And one of the things I learned in the Chicago area CSA study was that people who have eight or ten million dollars in net worth don't think they're rich. I, this may seem remarkable to you, but in fact they really feel quite inferior to the 100 million and 500 million and billion dollar people. They don't think of themselves as rich. And the difference between those groups, between a billionaire and a one percenter, is what? Ten million dollars compared to 1,000. That's a hundred times as much a billionaire has. So. I make the pitch, let's get some, some much better data on actually wealthy people. And, and also, if I don't mind me following on that, assessing the actual effect on policy. I mean, if the, if the establishing difference that's nothing unless there's an actual fact, they're actually they're winning. Uh, and that's what's wrong. I will mention one thing. There's an interesting study uh, being conducted by some people from Sweden at the University of Gothenburg, which shows even, it seems to me, even greater uh, when they do the kind of analysis we do, they find much greater differences between uh, incongruence across income levels. But the interesting thing about that is they have a very different political system. I mean, we don't think of Sweden. Is, is, do we think of Sweden as one that's even more dominated by billionaires? Well, there's more <coughs> class. There's more class politics in Europe in general. Okay. There are more differences by, okay. by income class. But there's also proportional representation, right, which brings governments closer to the middle. Correct. At least that's the. The usual well, line. you're you're not really talking about policy measures, are you? I mean, yeah, talking about most policy. of your presentation, except the Gillens data, did not have in. policy variables. <laughs> well, we have the representation equations I showed you, right? Where we actually have, I presented the table which showed spending as a dependent variable. Right. If you if you believe, you have to believe a number of things to take that seriously. And what they it's did in not a direct measure of policy. And what they did in Sweden was replicate Bill and pay. And I, I, well, first off, it is policy. And secondly, they replicated not our study; they replicated your study. Where is the policy measure? I don't. I, There's a, a bunch of something. dichotomous policy measures, same kind of policy measures. They they are not looking to replicate us. They're looking to replicate. Oh, you. oh, the Sweden. Yeah, sorry, I I was speaking of your presentation. Well, I thought I'd, I thought I'd done a pretty good job on your work. I mean, I thought I mean I spent about 15 everybody should <coughs> uh, 
to, to gratify Don even a little more, everybody should look at Marty Gillen's Five Reasons Why the Critics Are Wrong, which goes through pretty much all the stuff in Chris's presentation, I think. Maybe not all of it. Um, but, the, but the key points are probably pretty clear to you. First of all, there's no accounting for measurement error. These correlated errors between the affluent and the average. So that, sure, observationally, using these raw data, it's absolutely true. Everybody looks pretty much the same. But Marty had, I think, a very solid and very clever way of estimating uh, the covariance of those errors right. by using 387 particular cases. Which is good when you're trying to adjust statistical relationships, but not particularly good at all. In fact, not good at all when you're trying to assess congruence. Because you can't se you could uh, separate the error from a relationship. You can't separate the error from each observation. That's right. That's a reason to pay more attention <laughs> to when the difference to the <coughs> estimate than than to the raw data observation. Well, it just points out that regression analyses can you could get really nice regression analyses when there's a 53-47 split. What do you say? That's, that's basic statistics. What do you say <coughs> about what I claim to be Marty's most important graph, which is very simply. What proportion of the time a policy change occurs, simple bivariate relationship between that and what proportion of the public wants it? Yeah, well, I showed you that. I highlighted that point. That it's 26% when the middle want it and 37% when the rich want it. it For, forget the differentiation. Let's talk about how well the average citizen is represented. Forget the affluent, but, but, forget everything else. This is bivariate. But, but, but I know, I, I, that was, I think that's the point I ended on, that all opinion groups are, are misrepresented, underrepresented, every group, poor, middle, rich. The rich are slightly better represented than the middle, and both the middle and the rich are slightly better represented than the poor. But they're all that's poorly represented. That's because you have no data on the rich. It really, I'm sorry, I'll try not to get too excited here, but using the word rich does not make it so. Then the affluent. are not rich. I'm looking at your data, your published work, and I'm just taking it and I'm just saying, let's You're take it. You're looking at Marty's data with which I worked, and we call it affluent people, not rich people. Then They're not rich by the most remote stretch of the imagination. Well then, well then. $80,000 a year in income? Then, then, you're, uh, then I, I will say then. Only well, a graduate student would think that's <coughs> rich. Well, well, well. <laughs> I, I dare say there might be a few others, and, and uh, that 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 would would, would agree. Uh, uh, the uh, I'll say this. Fine. You, you, this is your this is your analysis of his data, and all I'm doing is saying is if you take another look at your analysis with him of his data. You get a, sl a very different interpretation than a regression analysis, which you discuss. Let now, whether you, you want to call whether you want to call it a fluent or rich, fine. I'll just seed and call it fluent. Now, let secondly, me give you a really second point. Real, real, real quick, second point. Real quick, second point. Real quick, second point. Thank you. Real quick, second point is that you're, 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 and you made a point about the real. You continue to make the point that the rich have more influence. You establish that there's difference, at least to some degree. What I don't see the. I don't see the evidence. Affluent I don't see more influence. No, you you're talking about the really really rich. That's what I'm talking about. You have evidence, other evidence that wasn't presented today in great detail, showing that really legitimately rich people who consider themselves rich actually showing have what? their preferences are different from, yes. from, from people with, yes. with what, what, what most of us would consider rich. And then the top 10%, the top 20%, top 30% right. further right. still. But there hasn't been evidence provided, and I'd love to see this evidence, and I'll buy the evidence if I see it, that they actually are winning, that their preferences are better represented in these 1,779 let's, cases. Let's or go other. through the steps of, of logic the way I've tried to do it. First of all, using general population data, the best you can do is the affluent, okay? Unless somebody figured, you know, I tried aggregating GSS surveys and so forth. You just can't get really rich people what? from general population right. surveys. So, step number one is showing that the affluent have more influence than the average. I, I think Marty has done that. I think he's, he's killed it. You know, as you say, it's a regression estimate. But all this stuff about the raw data misses the point about measurement error. This, so, step one is establishing influence by the affluent. Step two is saying, who among the affluent might have more influence than others? The fact that 
these only m sort of upper middle class people clearly do better than the average citizen, leads one to infer maybe if you have a billion dollars, you do even better, okay? Now you're right that it's very hard to prove. Nobody's got good evidence right. except historical and qualitative and so forth. But then consider the following steps of reasoning. First of all, when you do a survey like CISA of multimillionaires, you do find these very sharp differences. Not only that, if you look closely at that table, maybe I didn't leave it up long enough, if you, if you go through qualitatively and ask yourself, what are US government policies looking like on these issues at the moment? It's just unmistakable to me that whether it's minimum wage or EITC or pretty much Social Security, anything there, uh, Social Security is not having benefits expanded, the minimum wage keeps not being raised, etc. So the logic, it seems to me, begins to be somewhat persuasive that really wealthy people are, are probably exerting some influence. No, I, I, and I, I just would love to see that data today. Um, what, there's a reason why we go and look at 10 point differences where there's disagreement, because we, it's hard to see 10 point differences which are double the average difference in the entire data set as being due to measurement error, and we find essentially the same pattern. Secondly, when oh, we take- Oh, it's a real just wait, difference. Just wait, just wait, just wait. So then we do the second- The point oh, is the difference is no, but dampened no. by measurement error. They're Fine, but so the differences nevertheless are real, and so the patterns sure. are real. The patterns that we find are real. So secondly, we also is a very here's 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 a here's They're an analysis here's, here's an analysis affluent. here's an analysis I think you'll rich. like we 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 replicated your analysis where the riddle, middle and the rich agree and where they disagree doing the, the correlated errors Would you adjustment. Please not say the rich. The just the just to indulge me. The for middle a the tenth the fiftieth and the ninetieth where they agree and where they disagree and the effect of of the affluent is only there when they agree. It's not there when they disagree. In the raw data. Of no, the it's it's adjusting for the correlated errors. Right, I'm going to step back in here. So Thank when you. we find when we <laughs> so basically 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 the you the, feel physical violence. No, 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 no. The rich have influence when the rich in the middle agree, or the, the affluent have influence when the affluent in the middle agree, and when they disagree, they don't. Okay. With the regression analysis adjusted for correlated errors, I think we've done everything we can with your data to try to do what you've done. Okay, Ted, you have a question. Great. Sorry about that. Uh, that's, that's quite right, actually. Um, uh, in a way that, depending on the question I have, it speaks either more to, to Ben or to Chris. So, um, in, in the case, it, I think it touches on um, where um, something Ben wanted to think, so think about a few minutes ago when he raised the question about that graph that shows that even at 80% level of public support, right. you're only getting um, a path, uh, kind of the, the actual change, the reform, 40% of the time. Uh, and so there's those questions of empirical slash normative, what do we make of the representation story with any with any of these data? And, the, and that one, I think it's absolutely fine that some of these numbers uh, are, are fascinating. And, um, and but part of that is like, should that, one way I remember <coughs> that, uh, uh, teaching, when I'm teaching undergrads is I think, uh, we might think, first of all, notice, oh, that's, wow, we should, that's an important thing to know about our political system. Uh, the other is, is that in line with what we expect from a Madisonian system of government? That's perceptive. So it might be, it, from that perspective, the system is working, and working quite well. Yeah, so Madison is a great figure to mention in this case. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. I think, so the, but it also struck me a little bit, the two, though, when the extent um, Chris, in your analysis about uh, thinking about a certain percentage, I think it's more relevant there because it's about the percentage um, of times the middle class is winning out versus the affluent winning out. Um, and, uh, and as far as I, th I think mostly in Marty's analysis and then your, your joint analysis, of the, it, the, the, it's the percentage of times you say the middle wins out, it's almost zero. Um, and so, so it's largely in your analysis, just that we, we get these different percentages. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm wondering, regardless if that's the case, though, how should we think about that being, you could say, so probably look at the, the middle class wins quite a bit, or the, the middle income wins quite a bit. <coughs> thinking about, well, okay, we should expect that too. If that's true, 
the, even in a system where the wealth, the wealthy or the affluent have disproportionate influence uh, because of their wealth um, and access, the middle might have dis disproportionate influence because of their size. And there wasn't a lot of discussion about the size in either conversation. And so, in terms of thinking about what we expect versus um, uh, and versus what we find, and then the last piece of the question was was also with this place where. I, I just want to kind of towards building new theoretical ideas and understanding for the premix results you find. Did you look, uh, at, have you and Stuart looked at those cases where you get, um, where the, the middle uh, is winning sometimes, the affluent are winning other times uh, where they disagree, and what policies yeah. they're doing, and is there something that inductively we could theory kind of build some understanding out of about where they're being successful relative to one another. I would think that would be fascinating to see if there's anything you could detect inductively at least out of, out of that. I'd like to pick up on the Madison thing for just a moment. The, that, that graph about the 40% 40, 40 uh, success at getting policy changes when 80% of Americans want them, Clearly, that has something to do with separation of powers and veto points. Um, and my view of that is a lot like Jenny Mansbridge's uh, when she discussed that maybe the Madisonian idea becomes a handicap, the bias against action <coughs> becomes a handicap when the world's changing so fast. Um, what we cannot do is tell for sure how much of the use of those veto points is by the wealthy and organized interest groups. It's a matter of, of inference, but it's also the case that when, when Chris and Stewart talk about all the times the middle class wins, most of those cases, or a very large number of them, are when they oppose a policy change. Uh, because policy changes generally don't happen. Uh, and so that looks like a win for the middle class. But the middle class does not do well in getting policy changes. I think that, that graph shows it. The middle win when they disagree with the rich 26% of the time on policies they favor. I showed that. And, and the rich win 37% of the time. Please don't say the rich. The affluent. <laughs> affluent. It's, it's a hard habit to break. Um, Gillens doesn't find zero wins at all. I mean, the, the online, I don't know if you've seen any of this stuff, the kind of the online stuff. We usually just write a piece and it gets responded to, or somebody picked it up. But he, he writes responses, and he's, he's fully admitting that, you know, accepting exactly the same numbers. I mean, these exact same numbers. In the raw uh, data, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, hasn't commented on the regression of the results yet, which are out there, too, um, which are not the raw data. Um, uh, in terms of the policy, I think it's a really good suggestion. We've done the economic and social stuff. We haven't done, it's an interesting idea, and can I ask you a question back? Are you thinking of like kind of inductively like building a distribution of sorts from, just just look at the wins and see where they're winning and look at the losses and see where they're losing? That's, yeah, just That's the, the two groups, like so. We haven't done that. I mean, is there any difference the kinds of issues, that's, or does it just really does it seem random? I mean, no pattern that you could set back. I just was curious. Is that because it is a small set of, you know, relatively small set of, of issues where you actually, you're getting the disagreement and then you're, um, and then where one side is clearly winning or something. Well, see, we did, we, 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 we did for the paper we, that's coming out on this, um, we separated into economic, we thought, I mean, one of the things that seems most, most worrying to people, right, is the economic wins, right? Most people aren't worried about, you know, the affluent winning on, you know, uh, being more, you know, uh, liberal on civil rights or in the environment, or we're more, you know, winning on, uh, and so we separated it. We don't find any really, um, any any real difference at all there, worthy of note. And I, I could send that to you if you want. Um, we haven't thought about what you're suggesting though, and I think that's an interesting idea. So, thanks for that, and I might follow up if that's okay. Okay, uh, one more question. Yeah, in the back, James. This is to kind of follow up on uh, Ted's question, this discussion about win rates, and it's uh, more directed toward uh, Chris's presentation. Um, it's not immediately clear to me that the, um, that the theoretical uh, observed frequency of interest is what's most substantively important. 
uh, that if if the upper limit is that you know some group can win 100 percent of the time, I mean, you know, just confining just confining <coughs> an analysis to policies that pass, not even the Speaker of the House wins 100 percent of the time. Right. They get pulled by their own caucus, right. and so you know what I think would probably be more likely about what we would expect to see is you know an observed maximum in practice that's much lower maybe 60 or 70 percent uh in which case um you know it might make more sense to look at relative frequency perhaps indexing uh the win rates of other groups to whatever group might be most successful uh to you know for purpose of substantive interpretation yeah i i think that's a good a good idea we um we we have the thirty seven twenty six number right so which is um, so the tenth percentile winning the ninetieth percentile winning um, thirty seven percent of the times on things they favor right and so not not including things they oppose and uh, the middle winning twenty six percent of the time is there another yardstick you would want to use there to anchor the thirty seven so it seems like you're suggesting we need to anchor both the affluent wins and the middle wins or maybe just. I mean, maybe the only way you can really kind of, you know, get at that is to just uh, anchor um, middle and poor win rates uh, as a uh, proportion of the fluent win rate. But it's it's not satisfactory, but I think it's kind of closer to okay. what I think would represent the uh, substantive effects of the differences that you observe. So 26 divided by 37. Interesting. Thanks. Okay, uh, I think this was a lot of fun, but also I think there was, I think there was, I think there was light, there was light, not only, thank you. Um, no, this was great. Thank you to everybody. Thanks to you.